So last year at the symposium, uh, we this notion of craft versus large scale operation was an, an ongoing theme that came up over and over again, and it became and, and it was presented initially by Ch Chad Robertson, yeah, who, who talked about you know this striving that he has is now that he's in a mode of growth, which he's doing with Tartine, and he's starting to open lo locations that, you know, what established Tartine as such a great bakery is the quality of the product. And the biggest nightmare for anybody is when they, when they expand, go to another level of volume, and then get the word comes back that, uh, geez, it's not, it's not the same product that I remembered. And so that was his, so he, he, we, we called that from craft to scale. And we thought, let's, let's, uh, um, let's find somebody who can really speak to that this year, someone who's achieved that, who's done that. And, uh, and of course, you're, you can read the bio on Marcus in, in your program, but he's a guy that's doing it, has done it from, and again, from the ground level, coming in at the, at the very entry level of baking uh, with a, a, a few bucks in your pocket in Toronto <laughs> to uh, suddenly finding that, hey, I can do this, I'm good at this, and has taken it all the way and then taken a company that was a small little artisan company and helped them to grow it to uh, very uh, high volume levels with great reputation. So I'm gonna just turn over uh, the mic to Marcus Mariathis and thank you very much for being here today. Uh, and I'll let you explain how you did it and how you got there. Hello everyone. Uh, thank you Peter and Harry and Prados for this opportunity. I'm very honored to be here. Um, what I want to talk about, like, you know, we talked about, you know, very good bread, very good sourdough, very good history of the bread all these two days. And this is time for us to have the opportunity to big mass, you know, the bigger amount of population be able to enjoy that good bread. So how we get to that point, that's what we're going to get at today uh, in terms of what we can uh, share with you today. So artisan craft baking in large scale. So artisan craft baking in large scale, I'm looking at like, you know, there's, there's, there's things that you need to do. You know, you need to look at it. Why we need large scale artisan craft bakery products. That's the first category. First, you need to know why you're even doing it. Then second one, you're looking at what are the key factors in artisan bread baking, which have been so unique, so tasty, so, you know, nicer products. Why is that? What are the key factors? And what are the challenges in large-scale artisan baking? Okay, you decided you want to make it in the bigger mass production, so how are you going to face that? And what, are, what is out there that you're going to face with? And how do we overcome those roadblocks in order to create that superior product? So when you look at why we need large-scale artisan craft bakery product, you're looking at the, 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 the consumers, customers. There's awareness of health and wellness among the population, and they want, they want to know what they're eating. They want to know what they're putting in their mouth. They want to know what's uh, they're going in their, in their belly, like, you know, what, 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 what's, what's happening. So they, need to, they are looking for those things, right? These days, they want it. They're reading the labels. They're reading, you know, looking at the products and, you know, the mouthfeels and the taste. They want to know the superior taste. They don't mind paying an extra buck or extra 50 cents or extra you know, buck and a half for the products that value added to their meal. The bread is not anymore, what do you call it, it's a carrier, it's a, it's a center of the plate. People want to taste the bread as, as a one food item, it's not a supplementary item. And the, when you look at it, then the supply and supply of the artisan products, uh, you know, is not enough to the population that could handle. So how do you get the supply up? So the demand is so high, but not enough supply. Then you're looking at it, to make the artisan breads, you need to have the very good, high-skilled bakers that understands the process, understand the properties of, uh, you know, the old-fashioned European-style breads. You know, how do you make that happen? So you need skilled bakers. In nowadays, it's, it's very rare, very hard to find good, skilled bakers around the world. And then you're looking at the bakeries. Once upon a time, you find bakeries every corner be able to support the, the community that's around the corner. So you don't see that anymore. It's very rare to have a very good corner bakeries, successful bakeries, because the business model that they play in on those small bakeries is hard for them to keep up with those larger bakeries, larger corporations, larger supermarket in order to manage their profits properly, manage their business properly. 
they are great bakers, but at the other end, they are not a very good business people most of the time. So what happens? They fail. Then when they fail, they move away from those businesses. Then when you're looking at key factors to be a good bread, right? The key important, important ingredients, everybody we talked about in the past, Carl brought it up and other speakers brought it up, is time. Time honored fashion and temperature. You know, as a, as a small baker, as a skilled master baker, you know you could touch and feel and you know, you know how the dough develops. So you are, so without your knowledge, you actually looking at the temperature, feeling the temperature, feeling the time, so you knowing when the dough is ready, when the dough is fermented. And the third factor is a fermented status. It's very important to create the dough taste. You need the, 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 the flour and water need to be fermented or grains need to be fermented. So longer period of time, that's, that's the key uh, secret in your taste of your product and the profile of your product that you're gonna make. Then the fourth key factor is premium natural ingredients or the ingredients that you could say, okay, this is gonna make the difference in the taste that you're gonna eat that product. And of course, lo and behold, you need to create great recipes. So the recipes, you can't just put a flour and water and expect it to turn out to be good. You need to have a right proportions, right blend of ingredients that goes in, in order to create the premier taste. And of course, the process. The process, how you make the breads, what the process should be, you know, how long is the process going to take, and what are the steps that you need to take in place in order to get to that final level of the product and of lots of passion. And you need to have the love for the food, the bread that you're making, in order to create that special product that you're going to give it to the consumers, customers to enjoy. So now, take that, the key factors and say, okay, now we're going to say, we're going to produce large scale, bigger quantities. How do we do that without compromising the quality and or make it even better quality to the t better tasting product to the consumers. You know, when you're producing large quantities and to maintaining the integrity and the quality of the craft product, that's one of the challenges. Then the second challenge you're looking at is scaling up the process from the craft size production. Okay, you could, you could shape up the bread by hand, uh, whip up a dough by hand. How do you take that and, you know, using the technology and how do you make sure that that doesn't change the profile and texture or taste of the doughs? And the other one, we talked about taste of the dose. Taste is is very important thing for the consumers. At the end of the day, if the consumer is going to come back and buy your product again because it's going to taste good. They will buy you, buy the product for looking good, but they're not going to come back again if that doesn't taste good. The taste is key factor in order to get the consumers to come back in and get your products. And also, when you're producing large scale of production, you, be able to, you have to be able to supply the large consumer base. So you have to plan to prepare to do that in your production level, production methods. And the other important things on your large scale production is you need to have a methods and recipes that be able to repeat, be able to day in, day out, time in, time out, be able to do the same, pro same recipes you know, in, in the same line of productions. And when you're dealing with food service customers, you know, food service, large food service customers want to use, you know, your, your, your buns, your sandwich products, baguettes, anything that you call it, but they want consistent. They want consistent size that they've seen in a pan bread, for example, but they want them in your artisan products because they, they portion out their sandwiches, they portion out their meats. They had to be consistent enough that they could use these products day in, day out without compromising their uh, size quality or the price point, those are things very important. So they expect consistency. Even though you're producing artisan bread, high quality bread, but they expect consistency. And the even harder thing that when you're dealing with this kind of business is uh, finding the premium ingredients. And you could find premium ingredients, maybe, you know, 100 bags of certain type of grains. But can you find the same 100 bags in, you know, 5 ton, 10 ton? You know, same quality, same uh, consistency. So, so you have to search for it. You have to find the right people. Those are the challenges you're going to face with when you're creating mass production, uh, artisan scale mass production. Now you look at it. This is we go a little deeply. When you when when you're trying to come roadblocks, how do you come out 
of the roadblocks? How do you face roadblocks? And how do you be successful and produce in this? So first and foremost, we need to start with the very good recipes. So you need to create recipes that, you know, with the, with the, with the clean ingredient, with the ingredient that you use with, you need to create the, 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 the starter recipes. You need to create the starters. You need to create the fermentation that, for the starters. That's going to be day in, day out, be consistent, be able to produce on the, on the, on the lines that you set and decide to do. And then what do you do? You create methods. You create method for your starters because somebody else on your, on your production floor, on your bakery, somebody else need to follow that recipes, be able to follow the methods that you created. So you need to set standards, okay? For example, you're making these doughs. These are the times, these are the mix times, these are the fermentation time, these time there has to be able to use it, these time you should be able to shape the bread. Those are things has to be like recorded, has to be uh, written down, has to be, you know, create a, a system where that they could, you know, even somebody come off the street, be able to follow that and make that good bread. And next step is going into a train employees. Okay, when you get employees, one other thing that we need to do, we can be uh, creating breads. Okay, one day I'm going to create this, you know, baguette this way, and the second day the mixer decided to do, okay, I'm going to change it on a little bit, add some water and create something else. So if you, if you have that portfolio, then you'll never be successful in a large scale. When you do it in a large scale, you need to have a, either right or wrong. You need to have a one recipe, the method that you created, and you make sure that uh, employees and the bakers train to follow that process. That's the only way, even if you have problems, if you have issues, that you be able to say, okay, that's why that didn't work. And you be able to rectify that issue and create the proper uh, secure method that's going to work always. So there's important things to have them follow the process. And then when you're looking at, uh, when it comes to artisan bakery, artisan baking products in a mass scale, so you have to look at it from when the ingredients comes in and the time that the bread gets in uh, consumers and customers' mouth. So you have to, from start to end, you have to think about it. How do you want to control that process? When you look at it, ingredient storage, then you look at the temperatures, make sure how uh, old is that ingredients. The age of the ingredients is important. Then you're looking at scaling. Where are you scaling? What environment are you scaling? You have to control the temperatures. Make sure that control environment is very important for each process. Then you're looking at mixing, okay? Then you look, make sure that you have the right temperature in the mixing room, and you have the fermentation is the right temperature, and you have the water coming in right temperature. You have the flour coming in right temperature. You have to take the measurements of all those particulars and be able to get the final dose because what happens in a small bakery is that's one of the challenges you face with small bakeries. The temperature of the environment never be controlled. You always touch and feel. You can't do that in a large scale bakery. You need to be able to record and make sure that you control the temperature of the dough day in, day out. You can't overmix the doughs or you can't undermix the doughs because the water is hot or water is cold. I'm going to mix it at two minutes more. What happened? You damage the quality of the profile of the doughs. You oxidize dough when you overmix, as most of you know. So those are things very critical. <clears throat> when you look at a fermentation, you need to have structure in place. Okay, where are you going to call, hold these certain uh, starters? Certain starters you have to hold in a certain temperature, certain starters in uh, ambient temperatures. So those are things you have to design your bakery in order to facilitate those things. What's going to happen? Yes, it's going to take a little more room than a you know, uh, straight door production, but at the long run, it's a little bit excess space. That's all you're going to spend. You could still be able to uh, manufacture what you want to produce in a large scale. Then uh, again, makeup section. Where do you make your, shape your breads? Again, that needs to be controlled temperature. Control what time that get dough divided and uh, how much time that you given the dough to be divided, you know, how frequent. For example, if you mix a dough, if it is 15 minutes late, that's 15 minutes late, that's not good anymore. So you have to have the habit of, okay, this is the rule of the game. This is what I'm going to live by. And then you're looking at baking process. Yes, again, you need to have your set process in your temperatures and you have to have a procedure set in place in order to create that, you know, like almost a, you know, robotic, 
uh, mentality, but you're creating for artisan products. And cooling. It is very important, you, you cooling, how do you cool your bread before you send it to freezing? Because when you want to do large-scale artisan bread, if you want to travel the world, you need to be able to, only way you could give it to the end consumer is a frozen, frozen route. If you want to send, to be able to send bread frozen without changing the integrity of the product, you need to freeze them. How fast you freeze them is very important. What temperature you freeze them in is very important because it's going to be changing in freeze times and freezing temperature is going to affect the moisture in the bread and how much moisture you trapped inside your bread. Because don't forget, this bread has to stay in the colding freezers. You know, it could be six months, nine months before the end of the day, they'd be able to use it uh, at the end consumer. Then when you tell the end consumers, how are we going to use this product and what's the pro property? So one key thing on creating artisan products, you need to make sure that you create the structure of the product, the look, the final qualities that you want in your product, and the bake color before you get out of your door. So, and, and when the consumer takes it, basically at the frozen stage, so you still have your moisture trapped in, make sure that it doesn't you know, dry out, so it doesn't feel dry or it doesn't feel uh, unpleasant. So be able to get that in, you know, bake it off again, uh, you know, bake it off for eight minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, then you have your fresh bread, fresh bread in your table, in your home table, in your, in your supermarket, they'd be able to, you know, every couple hours you get a fresh bread. So that's something that you can duplicate in a small bakeries, having a millions of small bakeries. Uh, so this is, this is very successful that we find it and it works so far. And then you're looking at, um, we talked about already, the, you know, the consists of uh, process times controlled throughout the process. So the time is very important where you started and when you finish is very, very important. Because in the, in, the, in the artisan process, the minimum it takes for us is it could be 14 hours before you get a, uh, for example, a baguette. It could be up to three days before you get a, a sourdough bread. So the process time, it, you know, even when, when it came from small bakery to the large scale bakery, that never changed. But what we changed, then you're looking at uh, technologies, right? So finding the right supplier equipment to produce those, uh, you know, equipment. What we did, we didn't change the time, we didn't change the process, we didn't change the dough profile. What we changed, we changed the equipment to be able to handle, instead of producing, shaping 20 bread by hand, I'd be able to shape 2,000 baguettes by in the same time frame. That hasn't changed. So that's what very key, finding the right manufacturing equipment so you don't damage your cell structure, you don't damage your uh, crust profile on your breads. You know, make sure you have all the attributes, that, for example, having a stone oven, that's very key, you know, for your bag. If you want a nice, uh, nice thin crust, nice crusty, nice shiny, nice open uh, structure bucket, you need that. So you need to have those factors in place so you don't change those fundamentals. And then finding the right ingredient suppliers. Like, you know, when you're working with the suppliers, ingredient suppliers, is most of the time you have partners. Like, they have to be able to grow with you. They have to be able to understand what your needs are and what the consistency is. Especially the flour is a key ingredient. You need to have the flour day in, day out. Doesn't change. Moisture level, ash content, you know. Those are things very important for have the consistent operation in your bakery. So then process doesn't have to change every day. Just going to talk about a uh, little bit about how Ace Bakery started and where are we now. And just the, you see the little pictures here. Um, this is the first bakery in 1993. It's a bakery cafe uh, in downtown Toronto that started in 1993. Then it turns into a, so that time we supplied maybe 50 customers, 50 little restaurants. That's what we did. But in 1997, um, we turned into, uh, I would say, semi-large production bakery. Be able to supply supermarket with a fresh delivery of products. But you could see those products. Whatever we did by the hand shape, the, the first picture you've seen is still coming out of the oven the same way that you've seen on the, on the hand shape. Then you're looking at the, in 2009, we kind of went to the more of a uh, what do you call it? 
automated fashion on our uh, makeup scale, but we haven't, again, we haven't changed the whole process time. Let's take the same. Now you're looking at the baggage coming out of the oven. That's in 2009. That's our kind of a as automatic large scale production that we did. Then in 2012, Gaffney, South Carolina, we have the um, baguettes, you see the baguettes coming out of the oven. You might not be even make it by hand that consistency. So those, those are things, benefits of having these be able to produce in large scales and keep in the integrity of the product and the process. Then you're looking at in 2014, so burger buns, everyone eats burgers, but it's a complaint, oh, we don't have the great bun, great bread. So something that we be able to do fermented doughs to be able to make burger buns from the fermented doughs online. So that's something, again, you know, without putting a lot of stress in the doughs and stress-free production lines. So those are things that are key factors in order to be able to capture what we do from to this date, we haven't changed. Uh, what do you mean by stress-free production line? So basically what happens when you, when you, when you do uh, shaping baguettes by hand, so from your hands, you don't have a lot of pressure on your doughs, right? You just handle very, very generally, especially ciabattas, focaccias, baguettes. So how do you take that and put them in the automation? So when you're looking at bigger lines, it could be pounding the dough too much, right? So it's damaging the gluten. It's just killing the doughs, killing the power of the doughs because there's no additives in the doughs in order to be able to jump back on the strength when it comes to artisan products. So that's something that you have to be very careful uh, how the line that handles the doughs, you know, from the start to end. I guess the machines are adjustable? Uh, these ones are custom made machines and basically, you know, uh, you have performance adjustment on that. You could, you could set up your production line, but and also those mechanically built to handle this type of dose. Fermented doughs are different than the straight doughs when you're doing a, a tin bread, pan breads. Uh, thank you, Marcus, for, uh, for sharing your experience. Um, there is one part that you did not d cover into the roadblocks on how to overcome the roadblocks. How do you create the passion with the people on the shop floor? How do we create the passion? So the one thing that we learned when you, when you have the good products, comes out of the oven, comes out of be able to uh, be able to taste, see the fruit of the labor. That's something that we find it that when they, when they are experiencing it, when they're when they, when they living it through, they have that building that passion within themselves. In order to work in the artisan bread industry, like you need to have passion, first of all. You can come in and do what you do. And also what we do, that we are still following it, every employee, every baker, be able to take two loaf home every day when they finish work. So what do you, is they are the first salesmen for you. They are the first people that need to appreciate what they made, they love to eat. So that's something that we, from the day one, from 1993, they're still doing it to this day. So I believe that's also part of the value that added to the building the passion. It was not so difficult. <laughs> Question up there. Yeah, I'm just kind of curious on obviously the freezing aspect and how, how does that how does that change fundamentally the science that's happening behind the dough and what is kind of in your experience how are you guys managing that I mean what's that timing and kind of that that process. Sorry, I missed that size you said. Uh, just as far as the freezing of the dough and okay. the timing and how what is that doing to kind of the inoculation of your yeast and everything else. Sorry. How, uh, what does that process look yeah, like? Yeah, so we don't do frozen dough. We do frozen baked product. So we actually bake the product fully, almost fully bake the product. Then we flash freeze them. Then we store them in boxes. So at, when you, the product leaves our bakery, it's already leaving in a finished format. So you don't change your attributes of the product at all. So there's no, you know, in the, when the, when the when the, when, the, when the customer bakes it at their stores or uh, the consumer bakes it at their home, they don't have to worry about changing the profile or texture, taste, or there's very little you have to worry about, like no controls. Like basically, you warm it up and eat it. That's all you have to do. And there are companies that do freeze dough. Uh, there are quite a number of companies that, and uh, very often in order for them to have a successful long 
shelf life, then they have to they have a different model because they have to put other ingredients in the dough that are not necessarily uh, what you're doing, which is uh, part of the philosophy of your bakery is essentially all natural ingredients, no additives, no preservatives, no dough conditioners, so to speak. And uh, and I know that, for instance, I I work with uh, the Riches Company up in, in Buffalo. And they produce millions of pounds of frozen dough, but it's dough that's meant to be proofed and baked later on. In order for them to be successful, they they have to put in other ingredients that you choose not to. So this model is more of the par bake model, is what you're talking about, right? Yeah, basically, because in order to keep the artisan profile uh, intact, you need to make sure that the product leaves your bakery in full bodied. And uh, frozen doughs, yes, yes, there's challenges. That's one of the reasons that you see more and more people turning towards Farbake model versus the frozen dough. Also, you know, you have to make sure that when you're dealing with frozen doughs, you need to make sure that you have the right temperature uh, leaving the bakery, the right temperature in the uh, trailers that are uh, transporting the products, and the holding freezer temperatures, all are very important because that's why you, you need to put more additives in the products. Uh, that's a different model. That's also a successful model, but again, that's a different type of product that you're dealing with versus uh, artisan bread products. I know you have a few more slides to show. Why don't we, why don't we see the rest of this process, I and then we'll come back, not, circle not, back around, and, and, and ask some more questions. No, that's it. Uh, that's your last slide? Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, then, then we can. We'll move in. So, so the, the question that I'll ask one, and then, again, we'll open it up the floor. So in your model, the model for Ace Bakery, you par part of the idea is that you want to replicate an artisan bakery that's using that doing all from scratch baking, no, no um, uh, things that would go on the label that would look to the consumer as an additive of some sort. Um, so where do you draw the line? For instance, when you're baking with flour, that is the flour enriched, is, and if, uh, is it enriched with malt? Do you consider malt as an enzyme additive to be a natural product? Uh, and are there, and what are the types of products that you would not use in yours? that maybe perhaps another uh, company would choose to use? Yeah, so for example, this, this, this product that we use, we try to make sure that the, the consumers and customers they knowingly know what they're eating and what they're using. For example, like malted barley flour, we do use in some of the recipes that require. Um, and also, for example, um, for our Ace branded portfolio, we try to keep it all natural uh, and, and all the way. And there is, there is customer needs at the same time. Uh, that's one of the challenges you also face is a shelf life of the artisan bread products, uh, ambient shelf life, which is our products are basically one or two days. That's it. That's what you're going to get. But there's, there's some, uh, uh, like a, for a custom brand products, uh, there's going to be natural uh, preservatives that you could use that available that made from uh, wheats and uh, the wheat sour. For example, uh, Prados makes uh, you know sourdough starters that be able to give you that extra elevation on your um, uh, what do you call uh, from your ambient shelf life portfolio. Uh, those are things you could still use it and keep the integrity of the uh, artisan bread products. But again, that's uh, uh, you know we have the rule of the game for the Ace Bakery. We want to follow that all the way. Uh, but again, that could that being said, yes, there's uh, opportunities to elevate a little bit at the same time, be able to have the uh, consumers be able to uh, experience a good bread. Especially the sandwich makers when they're making sandwiches and you know, grab and go sandwiches need to be two to three days, two days on the shelf uh, for uh, uh, consumers. Okay, um, I have a quick question. You know, based, your, your company's been in business for 25 years. What is the most, suggestions you're getting from the consumer today on your bread you're making and what's the most requested item are they asking for because we've been talking this year last year about sprouted grains different flours different ways to mill what is the most what's the biggest request that you get because the baguette seems to be like the king you know when you look at from a from a small scale to a high scale that seems to be doing the most volume which challenges us all to get into other breads, like rye breads. But at the end of the day, you got to pay your bills. So, but what is the, what, where do you see the trend in your company going? So our trends, when you look at the last one, you see those uh, gourmet burger buns. Uh, gourmet burger buns, the brioche buns. So the, the, the food service, uh, the service items, like, 
you know, you have the middle of the road burger buns everywhere, but you don't have that high profile, high tasting, uh, fermented dough uh, burger buns. That's something that is last uh, few years we've grown like triples, you know, as far as the consumer uh, trends, consumer requirements, and also the uh, sandwich careers, you know, for example, we lately this year we launched sketchy at us. Uh, uh, we launch even a baguette bagel. So we have the baguette portfolio, but how do you take that baguette portfolio and uh, make it a breakfast option for uh, consumers that wanting to taste uh, the baguette for the breakfast? You can't eat the baguette for a breakfast. So we made it a form into a bagel, which is same portfolio as a baguette, but it serves you as a bagel for the morning breakfast. So those are the things that we found. Again, you have, you still have people with requirements for sprout grains and healthy grains, and uh, especially the protein uh, breads. Uh, basically, people wanted to have uh, early morning protein toast. So instead of eating a regular bread, I could eat a bread that have a protein requirements already filled, filled instead of eating meat in the morning. So those are the requirements uh, is out there brought up, um, and also. Uh, there's a portfolio that you call it uh, uh, toast, the baguette crisp and toast. Uh, those are the things that, uh, you know, the added value, snacking values, you know, people just snack more often uh, rather than eating the whole baguette all the time. And, um, well, just to give some perspective um, in context, uh, what kind of volumes are you, are you producing at, in, in starting, let's say, with how many baguettes a day does your company produce? How many burger buns a day do you produce, and how many sort of specialty breads do you produce, uh, average? So I would say in a in a shift eight hours, uh, I would say thirty two thousand baguettes in an eight hour shift for a given number. Is that at all five, five bakeries? Uh, it's, no, no, it's just one bakery, one, bakery. one shift. Wow. I'm just giving you. Then you could look at the math of uh, we have five large bakeries, uh, so then you're looking at uh, burger buns. You're looking at about. Uh, 800,000 bagel, uh, burgers, uh, sorry, 80,000 80, burgers, sorry, not 800, 80,000 burgers in an eight hour shift, burger buns. 80,000. 80, yeah. so now, just to give some a sense of scale that we're talking about. Huh? Just one bakery and one, one shift. So just give you a perspective of uh, what is large scale means in the artisan format. So, so what are the limitations that at, at produce using that much flour, that much product? What are some of the things you can't do uh, that you would like to be able to do, but maybe are limited by access to ingredients or something like that? So, when you're dealing with, for example, for take a burger buns, so you we use fresh eggs. So that's something that you know shelf life is very very short shelf life. So you need to be able to make sure that you have the proper scheduling done, proper requirements done in order to get that product made within that time. That's one of the challenges. Then you're looking at overall portfolio. When it comes to artisan consumers, they always trying to change things, different things. You know, the restaurant chefs wanted to have uh, different menu items every six months, every five months. So you have to have your model, the, the, the production model, be able to handle different products at any given time because you can buy new machines every six months. So you'll be out of business pretty soon. So you need to build your model that be able to handle that many different varieties of product with a similar same production line format. Do you have any specialty products that you work on a smaller scale? For instance, you know Jennifer can't give you enough flour to make your baguettes, right? Because she can't produce that much flour, but she's producing some you know unique products. Do you can you produce in within your now that you've built up a facility if somebody needs? A reasonable size batch. Can can some, a small supplier be supplying you? So we still have a smaller. Sorry, we still have a model that uh, we supply Toronto area still fresh, fresh deliveries uh, every day in the morning. There will be trucks going out delivering fresh breads. On those models, we always try out new ideas that will work uh, within the category. Then we could expand onto that. Like you can see, if you want to try some specialty products, we do a. Uh, focaccia lunga with those uh, Kambari tomatoes, you know, just half cut some, put them on top nicely. Those are the ones that you won't be able to produce on this level. If you want to produce, it's going to cost a lot. But at the same time, you could, you know, make sure that the market that wanted to appreciate the high level of, uh, you know, cost to the product, we still want to make sure that we still supply them too.
Any other questions out here? Uh, you got one. Yeah, go ahead. Um, these might be too nosy, but uh, are you able to talk at all about like the square footage of any of your bakeries or like the financial investment associated? I can't talk investments. I'm sorry. <laughs> Because we are part of a corporation that's uh, <laughs> well, we can't share those informations. But again, you're looking at the typical size of the bakeries. Uh, we have one of the bakeries about, uh, I would say, 150,000 square feet. Um, so that's basically sitting here. We're doing in uh, Gaffney, South Carolina. Um, so that's kind of average size you're looking at. But we also have a, one of the bakery that does only uh, toasting and the granolas and the uh, croutons and things like that. And do you have a, an organic line? Are you able to we, we do, up with organic flour? We do have organic line, yes, but mostly produced in Toronto. And we have to go through the organic certification and you have to follow the organic rules in order to produce those products. You have to have the cleaning steps before and after, make sure that it doesn't contaminate with your conventional products. And you have to carry organic sourdough starters and fermented dough starters in order to produce our products. So this is quite a challenge. When you think about it, if 1993 till today is only 25 years, right? So to go from a small, single-standing artisan bakery to something that's pr producing at the scale that you're talking about in that short of a time has taken a lot, has had to take a lot of growth and marketing. So how, does, how do you find the markets and how do you sell your product? Is it, is it custom labeled, like you know, private labeled, or is it under the Ace Baking label? And where do you, where are the outlets? Where are these breads being sold and, and used? So in in Canada, we have a very strong, I want to say, uh, Ace branded uh, portfolio. That being said, in in the U.S. portfolio, we do have some Ace brand portfolios. Also, we partner with uh, uh, companies that appreciates and wanting and that level of uh, products. We do custom brand products uh, with uh, some of the larger uh, companies. Um, but again, also every supermarkets and uh, the, the, the big suppliers and stuff like that, they also want to have that premium level that's been controlled and uh, have their appreciation for it. So we do, we do work in partners with them as well. Um, and also one other thing I want to mention when you're talking about I didn't bring it out starters. Uh, we have nine different starters, in-house starters, we controlled day in, day out throughout all bakeries. And that's one of them, that specialty that I, ha I have to say, I think we are one of the bakery that, in a large scale bakery that handled that many starters uh, in North America, I would say. I think more questions, go ahead, you got the mic, go ahead. Avery, yeah. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about like the people training involved and kind of your people management? I understand that with the scale, part of this is that we're decreasing the number of people, but still you spoke about what makes a bakery successful and the training elements. And are, can you share anything about kind of your principles about that? Yeah, I could scare a little bit, but when you're looking at training the people, you need to find the wanting and willing employees. That's first and foremost. The second thing is you have to have a training program as per what, uh, uh, what do you call job that you're going to train to, you know, the, the mixing or the operation of the lines or the scoring the bread, so things like that. And those are the critical job patterns. Then you're looking at a packaging uh, end of lines. Usually you'll be able to get them to understand it's very similar, simple format to other industries. Uh, but these are the unique ones, take a long time to train. It could be up to three to six months by the time you train a good mixer, you know, be able to understand what you want. What, what do you think, it, uh, I'll take one and you guys take one. Uh, what, is, what is it that, uh, that allows you to sell this much bread in a crowded marketplace with other companies doing par-baked par as well as fresh-baked bread? Uh, what is the perception by the consumer of your bread in terms of its quality? Do they, what's the feedback you get? Do you feel that you're, the standards that you established when you were the artist and baker yourself and, and working at, you know, and you've worked at the level of winning international awards for your bread, are you able to produce at that, at those volumes, that bread comparable to that? Oh, definitely, because one thing that I could tell you, when I first walk into the, the bakery that I show you guys, the Bakery Cafe in 95, uh, we don't have a controlled temperature in the bakery. 
we don't have the proof of that, you know, controllable. Um, you know, those other things are very important. So sometimes the product will be overproof, sometimes the product is not ready. In the winter time, the product will be, the dough will be cold. So you, you are struggling with a lot of different things. But now, that's something that we control throughout the process that makes it consistently great products all the time. That's something that we are proud of what we do. And, you know, we get the appreciation from the consumers uh, for that. Question, yeah, go ahead. Uh, um, yes, I was wondering, do you do cold overnight fermentation and how is that handled in your facility? So the overnight fermentation, again, we do overnight fermentation of our starters, not the final dough. So the starters could be somewhere from 50% of your dough, 40% of your dough, 80% of your dough. But those ones are, again, we have uh, rooms that built to uh, control that many amount of, uh, call it bins and stacks and uh, things like that to hold those doughs. Uh, again, we have uh, automatic scheduling that pulls out what time you should be taking out, what time you should be mixing, what time you should be putting the starters in, and what amount of starters goes in which doughs. Those are the ones that are all set up to do it so that way that you don't miss any of it. If you don't have a starter, we won't run the production. That's something. That's how we strictly are when it comes to rules of engagement when it comes to production. Now that you've become such a big bakery, what, could, why don't we take a mic over to them as well over there? Now that you've become so big and you're you're uh, able to buy so much product from your suppliers, uh, how do you make how do you work those relationships with your flour providers primarily and some of your other ingredients providers to assure the quality? You said that one of the keys was the quality of the flour. What's your how do you maintain that standard? So the so the one of the things that we determine we decide. We designed the flour blend, what we wanted in our product. That's going back, uh, for, I want to say around 95, 96, that time period. We said, this is the flour that we want to use. This is the blend that we want to use. To this day, we keep the same specs, different wheat blends that we use, different uh, wheats come from different areas. Um, so we kept it to that level, that level of detail in our flour blend, which is very important for us even wherever we produce, even when we moved to first time to South Carolina, we have flour, the blend that made by the company over here that was sent to Toronto to make sure that it works, performed the same way that we're producing in Toronto. And even the water we looked at and say, you know, is it the same type of water that we're gonna be using in Ontario versus uh, South Carolina? So we tested that for that too before we started this process creating these uh, uh, recipes and developments. We have time for three more questions. I, Betty, why don't you go ahead? Um, what's the best temperature um, for a lean dough as, as well as a um, enriched dough for par baking? Lean dough, in, when you say temperature where? In the internal temperature? Right. Internal temperature after bake? Mm -hmm. You're looking at about, uh, to be food safe, you had to be around 210, 208 Those Fahrenheit. Yeah, you have to, you cannot ship the product with a, it's a food safe product that goes out. Okay. It basically fully baked. But again, you know, when you look at a true or blue artisan breads, they're always nice and dark, but uh, we kind of bake a little bit less than that just to make sure that we don't get too dark. But uh, again, the product when it leaves is a food safe product, so leave the bakery. Okay. I always thought par baking meant you. It's not, it's not 50% par bake. I understand what your point is. This, those are the products. Yes, there is market for like that type of products too, but the, what we do is almost call it. I would call it a 95% baked. Basically, you know, the, when it comes to internal temperature, we make sure that's food safe. There's another question over there. Um, um, how do you? Uh, what is your employee retention rate, uh, and how do you keep them? So one leaving? of the thing. <laughs> So very good question. That's one of the things we do, large-scale production. We don't do small bakeries. <laughs> so, so again, uh, that goes with the, depends on the area that you have the bakery in. Some of the areas you have a higher availability of good skilled employees, and some areas you have very challenges. You know, for example, you know, for example, South Carolina is like you will have sometime up to 50% turnover, and if you're looking at uh, some of the Toronto areas, you will have only like. 10% turnover. Some other areas you might have 30% turnover. That's dependent on the, uh, the 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 area, the location that you have your bakeries on. Again, it's it's a market where that you know it's not a lot of people want to be you know dirtying their hands, you know want to you know full of flour in your body, 
or things like that. You know, everybody wanted to be in tech, you know, high tech uh, companies. Those are the jobs that, you know, all the generation wants. It's very hard to find good skilled people. That's the big challenge. Uh, do you provide um, um, ongoing training, like sending them to schools and stuff? like? Uh, so, students? yeah, so the, the way we set up our bakeries uh, is, is kind of a, like a, almost as, uh, like an apprentice program, it's a school program. Like, a, you know, training them from the basics, you know, what is, you know, every bit of it, we do that. So it's, that's, that's how I, you know, I, I, I hate to say this, but that's how, how I learned it. I learned from, you know, the German master baker that worked with me and a, and the French master baker, you know, most of you know, Didier Rosado, that's worked side by side. Those are the people that I learned from by, you know, being in it, being, you know, living it day in, day out. That's the best training that you're gonna get. So it's in-house training, basically, yeah. is what you're talking about. We have time for one more question, and then we're gonna, we'll stop and take a very short break. It sounds like we're all talking about how to train, how to take care of people, how do we bring people up in the industry. That's very important because that's starting to erode, and it concerns anybody that wants to stay in this business. And I think one of the most important things is that at the end of the day, we are in a people business. And people is what really makes things move in our business. So this is a question for you, Peter. Out of the graduates that are coming out of these schools, how many of them are gravitating or wanting to come into an industry for bread, for pastries? Is that increasing? Because these young students coming out and the education they're getting are the type of people that we're trying to retain, you know, to bring into our companies. And once we get them in there, it can show them the benefits of what the craft is, because a lot of us in this room, we went out, we knocked on doors to learn a craft, and we would go where whoever made the best croissant, we practically would work for free to get that. Today, you don't have that same group of people. So how do we get them in the door? And once we get them in the door, how do we keep them in mm -hmm. and continue that? And I think that's a really important thing because this industry is not going to get easier. That's right. Population's growing, and you need more people to be working in this field. Well, I can't answer the full question of it, but I can say that, that when a student comes to a culinary school and's paid a lot of money to be here, they don't want, they're not looking to, to start at a very entry level, except for maybe a short period of time to pay their dues. They need to earn back money. So they're looking, one of the things that they're looking for is a job that will pay a fair wage for what their skill level is and a chance to grow. I think the thing that most of them are looking for is growth. Very few of our graduates, I would say, realistically, go into the bread sector. The, and our, our baking program is growing. It continues to grow at a nice clip because people seem to be drawn to it. But it, both whether it's culinary or baking, our two tracks, we find that, you know, the big, I think the my observation is the thing that holds people in the industry and makes them willing to work hard for a few years is knowing that there is a, an, an exit strategy at the end that allows them to gravitate to higher levels of attainment of achievement, whether it's financial or management level or leadership level. Uh, and so that's what their aspirations are. At the level of, of just being a hard worker, which I think is a big challenge, especially for a large company where you need a lot of employees. How many employees do you have? Uh, we have uh, our, our section of the business, we have about uh, 600 employees. So 600 employees is a lot of employees to find and replace. Then you're uh, really, uh, what we're seeing is people are willing to work that hard who, who are people that are usually coming in either immigrant cultures or coming from communities where where that's a big step up to have a just steady job like that and are willing to be trained. And then, then it's a matter of finding people with the right attitude and mindset, which I think is a whole other topic for maybe the next symposium. We were talking about that earlier, is making that. So uh, before we run out of time completely, uh, first I want to thank you and give you, uh, again, a knife from Henkels for your work, not that you need another bread knife, but, uh, but please uh, take that from us. No. And